Thank you very much for coming to another session of the seminar. I leave Javeria with the, the introductions this time. Uh, I'm pleased to, to receive here Miguel Carvalho. He came from Portugal like three years ago, I guess. Uh, he did his study in statistics, but he works a lot in the middle of statistics and economics so, and overall in extreme value problems. So he will show us some of his work in non stationary extremal dependent structure, time, time and space. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Javier, for the for introducing me, also uh, for for inviting me. It's it's a pleasure being here uh, today, and I would like to confess that it's actually one of the first talks I gave in English here in Chile. So that's uh, I I I see it as a very positive as a very positive uh, point. So. Essentially, my, my talk will be about statistical models for modeling extreme values. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, about what extreme values are in, in a minute. So essentially, when we take a course on, on, on statistics, one of the first things that, that we that we learn about is this concept, which is the empirical distribution function, and which which is a non-parametric estimator, uh, and which which is very very appealing. Uh, uh, so, well, when we think about the the empirical distribution function, if if we have a just a, a simple random, if we had just a, a simple random sample, x i x one. So, if we if we take a, a random sample, uh, this is this is one of the first things we would teach in a in a statistics course uh, when we would like to, to estimate the empirically the probability of x being small or equal to to, to x. Now, so where this f of x essentially would be so the population counterpart of this would be the probability of x being small or equal than than x and in when when we are modeling extremes we are particularly interested in modeling maximum so we would be interested when modeling extremes we are interested in the following statistic which is the maximum of a sequence of random variables max x1 to xn and now suppose that we would like to estimate empirically the the probability of observing something which would exceed the maximum but just by epsilon just by a small quantity epsilon larger than zero what is the problem with using the empirical distribution function? The problem is that this, this turns out to be zero. So this turns out to, to be zero. Now for every, for every epsilon, for every positive epsilon. Now let's, let's make a parallel here. And now let's think that, uh, that just, just for making the ideas clear about what's the applied motivation for this type of, of models that I'll be speaking about today. And let's think that actually we would be interested in describing the maximum, say, of, and that, that these are represent here magnitudes of earthquakes. Suppose that the largest registered earthquake, say, in Chile, was the 1960 earthquake, we would like to attribute a positive probability to an event which really goes beyond that one. So if that one happened to be the maximum, we wouldn't want to give zero probability to, to that event. So we would, we, for sure, we would it's a small probability event. So statistics of extremes is about small probability events. 
Uh, but for sure, this would be a very poor estimate uh, for, for every epsilon larger than zero. So how can we extrapolate beyond observing data? So if this was our, our random sample of interest, and how can we extrapolate from the observed data into, into the tail of, of a distribution? That's, that's essentially one of the goals of what we try to, to do with, with statistics of extremes. So we would like, so typically extrapolation problems in statistics are all about surveys. Many times we, we, we even listen in the news about, uh, about say, Instituto Nacional de Estadística. So if they have a certain a survey of interest, well, they, they will want to do what? They'll want to extrapolate from their sample to a population. So here, the, the, the extrapolation problems of interest are into the tails. So the idea is really about extrapolate, but into the tails of, of a, so that's, that's the goal, okay? So we would like to be able to, using data, which lies on the bulk of a distribution still to learn about what, what we have in here. Okay, this is on the univariate setting, and let's think, what, what would be natural then, so we, would, we will want to, to, to have mo statistical models which allow us to, to, to assess the risk of events such as the one we were describing earlier, but what is really a statistical model? Well, a statistical model formally is simply a collection of probability measures indexed by a parameter, okay? Or in a more statistical terminology, you, you could think in terms of the, as a family of distribution functions. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the, the definition of statistical model that we would be teaching, say, in, a, in an undergraduate course in, on statistical inference. However, for sure, not every statistical model will be appropriate for modeling risk. Why? Well, because we, we want our models to, to have this ability to extrapolate into, into the details of a distribution beyond existing data. That's, that's the goal. Okay. So problems of interest come, come to mind, say, in, uh, say, for modeling earthquakes. Also in terms of other applications such as in finance, where this x here, the variables of interest, could represent losses of a certain variable of interest. They could represent losses on your portfolio, for instance. Okay, well, and so on this setting, we are on the, on the univariate setting, actually. So what I've been describing so far, it's, it's been on the, on the univariate setting. Now suppose that we would like also to model the extremes of two random variables. Okay, we'd like to, to move in, into into the into say the multivariate setting. Let's start with the bivariate. And Suppose now that this is x, this is y. And now also another concern of interest is how, how can I model the dependence between the extremes of these two random variables? Or put in a more formal way, how can I uh, assess dependence from a certain, for extremely large quantiles? Okay, so how can I assess the dependence between two variables, but at their extreme values, or at least at least beyond a certain threshold of interest? Okay. Think of x and y now as the two assets in your portfolio. As the suppose that x and y actually represent the losses, if if you have asset x on your portfolio and here you would have the loss if you had 
asset I on your portfolio? What would represent something like this? A huge loss, a huge simultaneous loss on both portfolios, which would be bad for you, certainly. Now, how can we, how can we assess dependence between the extremes of, of two random variables? Now, if, if we think about X and Y as representing losses supposing two markets, maybe there's actually some dynamic in the over time of, of this dependence between the extremes. Uh, can we use this Pearson correlation? No, certainly it's, it's, not a good, it's not a good idea, but I, I can discuss that with you in case, in case someone has questions on that. Okay, so the goal, the goal of the, the main goal, uh, I would say, of the, the work I'll be presenting today will be how to model the dynamics underlying extremal dependence uh, over time or over another predictor of interest. So that's, that's the main goal. That I, I take questions in, in between, so please don't be shy. Okay. Okay, so now the other thing is uh, what about statistical models now for, by, for this setting? Okay, if we want to go beyond beyond this setting. So if we want to model extremes, bivariate extremes, there's a special type of model which plays a, a key role on multivariate extreme value model. That, that type of model is, is the following, is a measure dependent measure. Take the space of all probability measures that you, you can define over a certain sigma algebra if you, if you will, over a certain measurable space omega zero, A zero. We say that G of H is a probability measure on omega one, A one, for all H in, in a subset of, of the set of all probability measures. So if it takes this form, so it's essentially a measure dependent measure is what? is a measure which is indexed by another measure. Go here to your statistical model, write G of theta. Now suppose that your theta is also a probability measure. Then you get a measure dependent measure, okay? Now if you vary H, then you get a set of measure dependent measures, okay? In the standard setting, we usually think on theta here, the parameter space as a subset of RP. Now, in, in, the, more, in the more general setting, we, we would like to think about G of H now as being indexed by a certain probability measure as well, okay? That's it, so the parameter of interest when we are in this setting, as we sh shall see in, in the next slide, is, is a parameter which is also a probability measure. And that probability measure will be describing the dependence between the extremes of two random variables, okay? So keep, it, keep in mind this, this definition. Essentially, it's a G of H, with G and H being both probability measures. Each one can be defined on, on its own measurable space. Now, on the univariate setting, we, we, we have a, we have a we have a distribution which has been studied by, by Fisher, TP, and Gnadenko, among others. And that's, that's what we would have. So the generalized extreme value distribution, which would apply for, it's the limiting law of the standardized maximum that I start discussing here. It's a, it's a three-parameter family. So it's really a statistical model. It's a G of theta. And you, theta, well, it's, it's just th these three parameters, a location, a scale, and the shape parameter. Univariate setting. Well, when we need to, to move forward and think about the extremes of more than one variable, what, what, we, what we need to do is the following. We, we need to, to go, we need, to, we need also to, to model what? We need also to model not just the marginal distributions of X and Y, but we need to think jointly. 
we need to model the dependence be between the extremes. So, and when, when that's the case, as we shall see below, we'll need a measure dependent, we'll need a measure dependent measure, okay? Okay, so just, just a, a something I'd like you to keep in mind here in terms of notation, I'll, I'll use this curly age for defining set of all probability measures H, which can be defined on the zero one interval and which have mean one off, okay? So this is a notation I'll keep, I'll keep using recurrently. So what are the statistical models of interest when, when we move to more than, than, when we move to the bivariate setting? Well, there's the following theorem, which is often known in the literature as Pickens representation theorem, which tells us the following. There's an object, which is the bivariate extreme value distribution, which takes this form, okay? Where, where G depends on H, when H is a probability measure on this space I just introduced earlier, and which takes this functional form, the G. So the bivariate extreme value distribution is no longer a G of theta, it's a G of H. It's a measure dependent measure, actually. Well, some, some remarks, actually, well, the generalized extreme value distribution, the bivariate extreme value distribution, well, they both start with, a, with an exponential. But for the bivariate extreme value distribution, theta is equal to the space I just introduced earlier. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a space of probability measures. Well, also since, since actually the, this, if H lives in this space, then we can we cannot have a finite dimensional representation for, for H. Or put differently, since that is the only constraint on H, neither H or G can have a finite parameterization. So we can no longer work in the setting where we would have three parameters. Well, we have just one, but it's one which, which is very hard to, to model. And well, it's obvious from the definition now that the bivariate extreme value distribution is simply a measure dependent measure, okay? And notice that here the G, so the, the space where the G is defined would be this one where, whereas H would live on the zero one interval, okay? So it's simply a one special type of non-parametric model, but that's it, okay? so. Now, how can we understand H? Okay, so H is a, is a, is a parameter of interest. How, how can we learn about it? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the following. So suppose we would have here Z1, Z2. So my marginals would be Z1, Z2. I don't know if you can see here, but Z2, Z1, If Z1 and Z2 tend to be of the same magnitude, this component will be around one off. Or put, or put differently, the, the, the more Ws I have closer to one off, the more mass I have closer to one off, the more dependent the extremes between these two random variables will be. Whereas if Z1 is relatively large, well then in that case we'll have that W will, will tend to, to be close to one, and if only Z2 is relatively large, then W will, will tend to be closer to zero. So more mass closer to one half means that I should have more dependence between the extremes, whereas more mass closer to zero or one will mean that I, have, I don't have such a degree of dependence between the extremes of these two random variables. Now, what's the connection between these Ws that I just introduced there? And, and the age itself. Well, it turns out that the probability of W, given that Z1 plus Z2 is above a certain threshold, this probability will converge when this threshold goes to infinity to H. Okay? 
So in practice, it is, it is as if for a sufficiently large radius, we, we would get the convergence of these Ws, of the law of these Ws to H. Okay? And this, this, this is a result which was proved long ago by, by Lawrence De, Deanne and Sidney Resnick. Okay, so, so, Indeed. Okay, very good. Yes, indeed, that's a very good question. So I've been, uh, I, I haven't been uh, telling so much about if, if there's a limit, that, that should be the limit. And conditions are related with conditions on regular variation, which is something I've been, I haven't been giving so many details on. But yes, you're absolutely right. If there's a limit, that should be that should be the limit. Yeah. Okay. So now, so we understood now that H will d determine the interaction or the the level of association between the extremes of the two random variables. And this is one of the estimating targets of interest. Of course, the statistical problem starts with our lack of knowledge on H. And the inference challenge is on obtaining estimates which obey the marginal moment constraints, the fact that it would need to, to have mean, mean one half, and which, which is, and it needs to be a density on the symbols. Okay, on the, on the d-dimensional setting, H would be simply a measure on, on, the, on, the unit, on, on the unit simplex, and there would be an analog moment constraint, but there would be one divided by D. There would actually be D constraints. Uh, okay, so I, I spent quite a few time on, on introducing actually, actually the, the main concepts because I think otherwise we would lose some, uh, some points of, of contact. So, I mean, the ideas that I'll be speaking in, in, the, following, in the following slides, they're related with essentially these, these, these three papers, one which has been published, two which will, well, one will for sure appear in 2016, one has been submitted, and we are uh, now doing some modifications to, to this work according to the recommendations made by the referees. I'll also comment uh, as, as I move along to connections also with a related paper which appeared on archive on 2015 and where, where these colleagues are, are doing related things but on the spatial context. Okay. So, so Let's move to these ideas on non-stationary bivariate extremes. So we've been discussing about univariate, bivariate extremes. What are, what are non-stationary bivariate extremes? What, what sense can we make out of that expression? What, what we really mean with, with that? Okay, so the, the main idea is the following. Suppose now you have a family that, well, so far we've been discussing age here, uh, but now suppose that we would want to consider here, instead of having just one age as a limit, we would have a family of ages in the limit, okay? Instead of considering just age, suppose that we would like to consider a family of, of ages. By the way, age is often called as the angular measure or sp spectral measure. So when we have a family of, of spectral measures, uh, things are challenging because now you need to, to obey the moment constraints not just on a single age, but you need to obey all the, the moment constraints for each of the ages themselves. Now another question is what sense can you what sense can you make of, of this? Uh, so one idea is the following. Now actually, this is an important part as well. So I'd like to spend some time here. So. 
first ID is from moving from a single age to a family of ages. From the applied point of view, what's really the motivation for this? Well, suppose that you, that you have k plus 1 samples or k plus 1 populations. Of the doubles I of the doubles I just introduced before, these doubles here, the z ones divided by z one plus two, and to, to give you an applied example of interest, suppose for instance, uh, one one example which we used in, in the past was, well, suppose you have you have two time series. And in k plus one sites, and these sites are forests. Now we would like to compare the the temperature, the extremes, the extreme temperatures under the forest cover, and that's one time series, with the temperature in the open, in a nearby place. Okay. But now we have we want to learn about extremal dependence in several sites. We can, we can just learn on each of the sites individually, and that can be one way to go. Or we, we, can, we can try to do something which, which has a flavor of a regression, which is, well, maybe forest one is, a, is characterized by a certain predictor, say, a different altitude, forest two, is characterized by a different predictor, different altitude, whereas the forest K plus one is characterized by an even, so with, with a different altitude. So in the same way that with linear regression, we try to explain what happens to the conditional mean as we change the covariate, here we would also like to understand how does your level of extremal dependence react to a certain covariate? How does it change over a certain covariate? Okay. Now, for that, we need we need to move from from this concept of, of angular measure or spectral measure to to a context where we would need to consider a family of spectral measures. Each of the measures would be associated with the value of a covariate. Okay. Now, one of the models we, we proposed recently in that, in that direction was, was the following. Suppose that the spectral measure HK relates with a reference spectral measure through the following specification. That is, suppose that Suppose that the family of interest where we are working is such that each of the elements in that family is given by an exponential tilt of the baseline spectral measure. Okay? So each of the elements in the family is related through this specification. So we can obtain each, each one of each through a suitable distortion of H0. And that's, that's what we proposed in, in, in this paper. Why? Well, the applied motivation again was, can we learn about extremal dependence through how, how does it evolve over a certain covariate? Okay, so we need to move from a single probability measure to a, a family of probability measures. Now, one of the problems is that the in, in this setting, we, we had this type of data. Well. We, this is just simulated data to illustrate the main ideas, but what we had was, okay, so we have, for each value of x, we have several w's, which, which are often known in the literature as pseudo-angles, okay? So the, the distribution, the marginal distribution at each value of the covariate should be one-off, and as you can see, it's, it's centered definitely around one-off, okay? 
And this, this plot here, for instance, it would be compatible with this idea that you increase the value of your predictor and you increase the level of extremal dependence because you tend to have more mass here concentrated around one half when the covariate is very large. Now, in a true regression setting, you would like to have x in w, but in this way. It can happen that you, you don't have exactly, uh, for each fixed x, uh, several w's. It can happen that the x's and the w's are really scattered across uh, here, the, the plane. So, how can, how can, you, how can you then still estimate uh, uh, here uh, uh, as, as a predictor dependent spectral measure okay and why would you want to do that if you think about the dependence between the extremes again as as higher dependence meaning higher risk think about the portfolio example so if if the if the losses at the extremes are extremely correlated then that's uh, that's uh, that's an issue. So higher level of extremal dependency is typically regarded as a synonym of risk. Uh, now, why would you want to to learn about the way that your risk evolves over a certain predictor? And there's a, actually this, this this makes the idea very very clear. So it's a it's a it's a non-technical slide, but I think it helps conveying the idea. Whoa, we should get inside. It's okay. Lightning only kills about 45 Americans a year, so the chances of dying are only one in seven million. Let's go on. However, the annual death rate among people who know that statistic is one in six. Why is that so? Because people would change their behavior. Given that they know the statistic, they would, they would tend to be overconfident, and so risk needs to be adjusted for the value of the predictor, okay? So conditional on knowing the value of the statistic, risk will change. It's exactly the same thing here. Everyone has, has been thinking in the literature about the single age, but we would like also to learn how this, change, how this age is changing with a certain predictor. How is the dependence between the extremes evolving over a certain predictor? So, So if we want to move from here, which is the setting uh, on, on the paper I mentioned earlier on, the 2014 paper, to here, the, the challenge starts that we, we need to, to move from this, this type of, of family now to, um, to an age which is indexed. We need, we need to go a step further. Ideally, we would like to model exactly this, age x, such that x is is really well this of course still would include this one but it is it is more general so we would really like to think about families now indexed by a predictor but to a continuous predictor okay so so what's what's the idea so what's what's our first concept here I'll First concept reads as follows. Now, suppose h of x is absolutely continuous. For all x in x, this set here is used to represent the, the, the predictor space. So, so the predictor dependent spectral density is simply defined as just the h x dw. That's, that's it. And in what follows, we'll refer to this set as the spectral surface. So to this as a predictor dependent, uh, so predictor, to this I'll, I'll refer to as the predictor dependent spectral measure, to this the predictor, predictor dependent spectral density, and to this set I'll refer to as the, as the spectral surface. Okay, so the idea would be, okay, how can I incorporate the non-stationary T in the extremal dependence structure in, into into the into the into the model. So the idea is really moving from this setting to this setting. So moving from a setting where you have uh, just a, a single spectral density to moving to this setting where you would 
you would have a spectral a spectral surface here. Okay, and if you if you want to think about the data, that that spectral surface essentially would be telling you the law here for each value of x. Okay, so in a context like this, you would move from for very low values of x, you would be in a case where you have you would have lots of asymptotic independence, uh, whereas whereas as you increase the values of x, you would have more dependence between the extremes of these two random variables. Okay, that's that's it. How am I doing on time? I tend to speak too much. Okay, okay. So now, what's what's another another point of view to to this? So in this setting, we we just want to model age indexed by x. Another another way to see this is is, is the following. How, how does this connect with also with, with what other people have done in in the univariate setting? So, for instance, there's a there's this very famous paper by Davison and Smith, which is a paper pu published at the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. It's a paper with discussion. It's 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 a widely cited paper on on our fields and uh, on on other fields as well, where people have asked themselves the same question. How can I model the extremes uh, when, when actually the marginal distribution could be changing over time? And what people have, have been typically doing is the following. So they, they allow the, the parameters of the generalized extreme value distribution to evolve over a certain predictor. Typically, mu and sigma People typically do not allow Xi to change over the, the predictor. But it, it really depends on who, who's, who's modeling and on the amounts of data that you would have as well. So what would be the analog of this, of this approach for the bivariate setting? Well, we've seen that, well, the bivariate extreme value distribution is just what? Is an extension of this, but where it's no longer a G of theta, it's a G of H. So the natural extension of this would be just go there and get your g of h x, with h x being your 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 predictor dependent spectral measure. So how to model non-stationary extremal dependent structures? Well, a natural approach we 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 think is simply is simply doing what I was mentioning earlier. So just taking g indexed by h of x. So, and that's why the need for this type of family here that I was mentioning earlier. That, that's why the need for moving from this context to this context here. Okay. Now, an important question is how to estimate age of x? Because now, now if, you, if you have data, if you have doubles, the first question is, how can you get Ws? Because now if you're telling me that, that actually your limiting law depends on x, then actually your Ws will also need to be depending on x. So there's actually already some challenging challenges in obtaining the corresponding W of x's. But that's, that's, the, that's, is, that's essentially what, uh, and even though I'm not giving details on that part, I can tell you that that's also something which which needs to be adjusted as as well. So, okay. So, if we want to estimate age of x, and if we want to get a valid bivariate extreme value distribution for each value of x, we would need to obey still the moment constraint. Okay, and I'm I'm I keep focusing on the bivariate setting, but just for 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 purposes of simplifying the, the, the ideas. Okay, so here's an estimator which 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 we which we considered. So this is a kernel smoothing estimator. Are are you how many of you are familiar with kern with with kernel smoothing ideas? Another I Watson? No, so essentially these these are methods. If, 
which which will allow you to do some so the non parametric estimator of a density well here we have the empirical distribution function now when we want to estimate the density the non parametric estimator that that it's typically used is 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 very as as the following as the following form okay where this k h is a kernel so more on this you could you could find on for instance one one then jones on a book uh, on on chop by uh, which has been published by by chapman uh, and if you and if you're familiar with R, every time you use density, so the density in R, that's what it is doing actually. And and in this way you get a non-parametric estimate for the for the density. H here is the parameter which is responsible for the smoothing. It's the so-called bandwidth. Okay, so here the the ideas are somehow analog, but it's on a regression setting, okay? So there's two kernels on, on this setting. There's a kernel for the 0, 1 interval, or the part which is for the angles. And there's another part, there's another kernel hidden in here, which is for doing smooth, smoothing on, on the x direction. I'll open this a bit more. So that's the kernel that, that, uh, that is responsible for the smoothing on the x direction. Whereas this beta here is a kernel for the W direction. Okay, so we are doing smoothing on two directions. Okay. Now there's there's this theta b of x, which asymptotically tends to be concentrated around one one half, and that's that's really easy to see if you're familiar with another I Watson estimator, because the denominator would be uh, an an estimate of of the conditional mean which needs to be one half so you get one half divided by one half here okay so there's three parameters uh, about which we need to, to learn from from the data there's the B there's the new and and the tau so the B will smooth on the X direction so it's a smoothing parameter on the X direction the new will will be the smooth smoothing parameter on on the W direction and this tau, we, 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 we introduced it for adjusting slightly the centering of, of, the, of the kernel. So this turns out to reduce slightly the, the bias. Now, the nice thing about this is that, well, first it has a, a, another I Watson ty type of flavor. So this is extremely easy to, to implement. Uh, the, the challenge of the moment constraint, it it turns out to be to to be given by by these expressions, and so this this turns out to be one off. So the estimator obeys the the moment constraint still. Okay. So here is a, just one simulation example. Uh, in another talk, I, I had more. I had more, and in the paper we also have more. I, I didn't want to show all, all of them in here. Uh, so in the in the left, we, we have here the simulated data. So the simulated data is here on, on underlying the box. And these are the true spectral surfaces. So for each value of x, this, this will have mean, mean one of. Okay? And this, this is the corresponding estimate. Okay? So one of the things that reviewers uh, suggested to us was the following. It, as, as you can see, so here for values of x which come closer to the corner, such as x equal to minus 0, 3, or x equal minus 0, 8, uh, our estimator always has more difficulty here in picking. And this is, this is a typical issue with kernel estimators, which is boundary bias. So. Uh, can you do boundary correction or can you reduce bias as x uh, gets closer to the here to the boundary of, of the observation 
so of x okay and uh, now we we have been working on that and that's something that that is feasible but it needs an adjust on these on these weights here okay okay so I think I have around 10 minutes. I'd like to devote the remainder time to, to an application of, of these ideas to, to modeling uh, dependence between, the, between losses, between markets in, in Europe. Uh, OK, so in recent years, this is, this is something which has been widely discussed. Well, people speak about an increased integration of European stock markets. Uh, well, and in the finance literature, this has been uh, something which has been widely studied. Well, there's there's actually some interesting uh, papers which which have been putting forward the EMU, which is the which stands for the Economic and Monetary Union, as the as the causal driver for this increase. And well, people have been looking at this with methods which don't allow you for extrapolating to the details of a distribution. So which would be something where you would like to... So it's not just looking at the integration between European stock markets. Is the main interest, one of the main interests is in understanding whether those markets become very, very integrated <coughs> when, when there, there are extreme losses between each, each of the markets. So, however, so given that there, there's been quite a few attempts to, to ascertain the dynamics actually governing how the extreme value depends between the losses of, of, of pairs of stock, stock markets will really change over time. I mean, there's these two very cited papers. One is in a, is in a top journal in statistics. Well, Statistica Sinica, it's a really a very good journal on statistics. The other one is on the second, uh, on, I would say, the, the second top journal on, on finance, which is the Review of Financial Studies. And in this paper, actually, what they do is, is something which is rather arbitrary. They just go into the, into the data and they say, OK, so let's focus on this window of time. Now let's focus on this other window of time and this other window of time. And let's, let's compute the measures of extremal dependence on each of these windows. And let's see whether there is an increase. Now, there are several arbitrary aspects in, in, in this, uh, starting with the point, how can you, how can you really define the, the, the width of, of your windows? Uh, how sensible are the results to that, et cetera? Can you do that in, a, in, a, in really a true regression context? OK. Uh, so, so okay, so the data consists of three, so I have three stock markets, indices of those stock markets, so the CAC 40, the DAX 30, and the FTSE. Uh, CAC is the French, so the DAX is the German, uh, and the FTSE is, the, is the, the one from the UK, and the data were gathered from data stream. So we have data from 1988 to 2014, so that means it includes the, the recent uh, financial crisis, the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which is challenging by, by, many, by many standards. And we use daily negative returns, okay, which can be used as proxies uh, for, for these markets. Uh, if you, I mean, given... Even uh, I would like just to make uh, the following disclaimer. Uh, I remember very well the, the first time I heard about about returns, and this was very confusing to me the first time I. Uh, so something which which is important. So this is the def definition of log returns, and if you use a Taylor expansion around. PT divided by PT, I'm sorry, uh, around one, this should be what? PT divided by PT minus one, minus one plus O of PT divided by PT minus one, 
minus 1. What is actually this? So this is simply PT minus PT minus 1 divided by PT minus 1. So log returns are simply an approximation. You can regard, you, one way to regard log returns is a, as an approximation to the, to the, the percent, to, to the percentual change. Uh, so if you take negative of returns, you are essentially looking at the losses. Okay, I'm happy to discuss these things at the end. I would like to, to move on for the sake of time. Okay, so here is the here is the, the data. Okay, we would have here the these are the pairs of negative returns, and this is a scatter a, a scatter plot using a time varying color palette that you that you have in there. So that means that gray points will tend to be more observation. So this this will tend to be so the very recent. So the the ones which are which are gray. Okay. And I'll focus here on on this one. So when we zoom this one, we we see that there's quite a few gray points in here. There's a few blue ones as well. But if this was if this was compatible with, so this this would be suggesting what? This should be suggesting that the dependence between the, the extremes would have been increasing over time. Can we see that on our estimated spectral surfaces? Well, that's that's precisely what we see. So it so in 1988 we would be having more mass here close to zero and into one. And as we keep moving, as we keep approaching, say, year 2009, we start really having here more doubles closer and closer to an half, uh, being closer to an increase in extremal dependence here over time. And this is all in this regression setting I was discussing earlier. Okay, these are just a few profiles of the spectral surface, cross-sections, technically they, they would be cross-sections, cross-sections of the spectral surface for a few key, key dates uh, uh, which are related with, with a few um, episodes of interest in, in finance. I can't remember about all of them, so I, I, I I'll be silent on, on that. And if we, if we still have time, I think I could comment on this, but it really depends on, on, on the chair. So I would like to, I would like to, okay, okay. Uh, if otherwise I could use them for the discussion if you oh, well okay well so I'll, I think I'll, 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 I'll I would prefer moving directly to the discussion and having having questions also so that I could get your feedback and I, I think I've spoken around for for too long I, I'd like to to listen about your ideas as well. So essentially I've been discussing models for, which allow me to understand how extremal dependence may be, may be changing over time. Now, uh, so, and that's it. So I, I take your questions now. 